against Donald Trump. Gary, you're fired. Ninth person voted out of the tribe. Showed us the reality of survival. The tribe has spoken. Helped America choose its voice. That was amazing. Thank you. Trumped us in the shark tank. I called him a pig and you called him a liar. So he's a lying pig. Yes. Produced the biggest award shows in the world. And the Emmy goes to... Kate Winslet. Turned a game show sensation into a syndicated hit. You know what a trapezoid is. Two times five equals... And produced a miniseries of biblical proportions with over 100 million viewers. Millions of Americans were tuning into the Bible. The History Channel miniseries is breaking all sorts of records. The Bible, now the top selling TV miniseries of all time. The Bible is the water cooler talk in the United States of America. Executive producer Mark Burnett. Jeff, thank you so much. Rick, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here today. We spent the afternoon together um, and spoke a little bit, and uh, I'll share some more. It is weird, though, for me to be getting an award, and it's there, what should be just saying thank you and getting off the stage. They're asking me to be up here for 40 minutes, so it's the longest acceptance speech. <laughs> you know, I produce a lot of award shows, like the MTV Movie Awards, the Emmys, the People's Choice Awards. I'd be having a heart attack on live TV if someone took 45 minutes to say thank you. I'll be pulling the plug. All right, so I am, um, but I, I'm, I'm glad to, to share. You know, I've met a lot of people here today and um, something that's came on my, um, a couple of funny things have come to me today and, and something also serious. One, one of the, uh, the funny things, well actually I'll, I'll say that for me. Let me just, they, they wanted me to tell you how I got started. And so I actually, when I was 22, um, was leaving the British Army Parachute Regiment. It's like a ranger battalion in, in Britain. And, um, you know, they always offer you special things to get you to sign on in the military, gonna make you a helicopter pilot, all these other things, and sign on for nine more years. But something said to me, you know what? I really wanna go west, you know, and, and go to America. Uh, and, you know, I had a few hundred bucks and I um, knew there was military work. I mean, the only thing I was trained for was to sneak around, blacked out in my face, and shoot at people. I mean, in the parachute regiment for five years, been in three wars, and that's all I was trained for. And I wanted to go west, and I thought, you know, I knew they were hiring you know, foreigners to go into Central America, because legally, there were meant to only be 500 Americans down in Central America, but there were thousands working for the CIA in America down there under a guy called Oliver North. You may remember his name. Um, and so I decided I was going to go, and I had some friends who'd done that, I was going to go down and go to Central America. And um, I was at the airport leaving, our only child, and my mum was there and said, you know, I had not told her, obviously, what I was going to do for a job, right? I had not told her that, <laughs> obviously. Um, but as I was leaving, my mum said to me, you know, Mark, um, you've really put us through virtually hell for the last five years. We never knew where you were. We'd get these random um, telegrams. There's a, a British Army tradition that before you go into a serious action where you're likely to die, you must send a telegram home, and I love you, and I care about you, and I may not see you again. And she had like 25 of these things, right? 
and must have been horrible. I mean, so thoughtless as a child to go and do that, actually. To be honest, as a dad now, I'd be a nightmare if my sons did that for a job. Um, and, you know, she said to me, and we've put up with everything. We've supported every idea you had, including the parachute regiment instead of law school. I went to law school when I was 16 and pulled out when I was 18 and went to the parachute regiment instead. I mean, I'd seen one too many Rambo movies, actually. That was the problem, I think. Anyway, so now I come to, I'm at the airport. My mum says to me, just promise me, son, whatever you're doing in America, no more guns. And I love my mum, you know, and um, I hugged her and I kissed her and said, I, I promise. So now I got my ass sat on a Pan Am jet to America, a few hundred bucks and zero plans and zero skills. I mean, zero. I'm a soldier and I can't take a gun job. <laughs> I'm kind of screwed, right? Um, but I did know one person in Los Angeles, a friend since I was seven years of age, called Nick. And I knew Nick was a chauffeur. So I showed up at LAX, a few hundred bucks, army jacket and a bag, and I figured out finally how to use this payphone, which was so different from England. I reached Nick, and he said, oh, where are you calling from? Like the Middle East? Or I said, no, I'm at the airport in LA. You know, can you come and help me out and pick me up? He said, you're so lucky. The family that I'm a chauffeur for are away for a few days. You will not believe the car I'm going to pick you up in. I'm like, <laughs> well, okay. 45 minutes later, Nick shows up in a Lamborghini. I'm like, I love America. <laughs> it's amazing. Nick's an idiot and Nick's got a Lamborghini. This is, this is made for me. Right. Anyway, we go back to Nick's house, you know, and... So now I'm there and we have a beer. And I said, well, can I just stay here? You know, because he's got this um, <clears throat> separate part of the house. And he said, no, no. He said, he said, but this is great, Mark, this sort of joke. He said, you know, they're away all the time. Whenever they're away, you can stay here. He said, because I have girls over and I say it's my house. And they think, I've got, they think they're my cars and my house. I'm thinking, this is getting better by the minute. He said, but you can't stay here the whole time. I'll, get, I'll lose my job. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, well, let's try and find a job like this. So I got the LA Times. I'm looking for, like, dream job, Lamborghini. <laughs> People never home. You get to pretend it's your house. And, there were, but, and I did see one job that was a live-in job, and it did say car. It didn't say Lamborghini. It said car, you know, board, food, Beverly Hills. It's getting better. Um, and they had two words that like, were the crusher, child care. <laughs> and Nick's like, that's not going to work. I said, yes, it is. He said, what do you mean? I said, desperate times, desperate measures. I called the number, got myself that night. So I've now been in America three hours, illegal alien. And I called up at 624 North Beverly Drive, Beverly Hills, and got an appointment for that night. And I go over there for an interview, and of course the other people there for the interview, mainly Central American women, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, you guys are so lucky I didn't take the other job. Uh, <laughs> kind of sad but true. Um, anyway, the guy, the, the guy who was interviewing with his wife, he was like in his 50s, and his younger second wife, kind of had the whole Beverly Hills thing going on, you know. Um, <laughs> and um, he says, next. And so I walk in, and the guy looks up and says, what are you doing here? I said, oh, sir, I'm here for the childcare job. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 22, sir. He said, 22? He said, let me explain to you. I've got a three-year-old from this marriage and a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old from my first marriage living here. The last thing I need is another kid. <laughs> I want someone to take care of the kids. And I said, well, you know, I think I could do a good job. And the woman says, Irv, Irv, Paddy, her name was. Paddy said, Irv, let's give the guy a chance. He said, where are you from, Mark? I said, I'm from London. She said, oh, we love London. 
And her husband looked at her like she was some kind of freak that she's now encouraging me to keep going. And I saw an opportunity and I went for it. I said, that's great. I said, absolutely. And he said, let me take over, Paddy. Let's get over. I don't want to waste time here. Mark, you can see we live in a very wealthy house and this is a like massive Beverly Hills mansion. I've never, it's like a hotel. I've never seen a house like this in my life. And we lived in one, like three bedrooms, one bathroom, in like a house about as wide as this stage. Um, he said, we expect the childcare person to do a lot more than just childcare. We want you to clean. Can you clean, Mark? I said, sir, I just left the British Army after five years. They came around with a white glove to do an inspection. They never found dust on my locker. <laughs> and Paddy said, you see? <laughs> and then Irv says, well, can you do like washing and ironing? I said, sir, British Army. I could put a crease in your sleeve so sharp you could shave with it, sir. <laughs> and again, Paddy is like, see? Because now she's feeling really proud that she's, she's onto something that her husband's not. But then he got me. Can you cook, Mark? I said, sir, I'm British. My mum can't even cook. <laughs> The sick thing, this is so, this is true, but I'm not, this is not my made up thing, this is true. So anyway, clearly it wasn't happening, right? So I went outside and Nick's out there in the Lamborghini, so it wasn't all that bad. And Nick said, you get the job? I said, well, I would have done. The younger wife, she kind of liked me, I would have got the job. But the older husband, he wasn't really going to have me move in there. And Nick said, oh, no, no surprise. I told you this childcare thing was silly. Let's go back and have a beer. I'd left the number, at 10 that night, same night I arrived, Paddy called the number at Nick's place, said, can you start tomorrow, 10 a.m.? I said, I'm there. I went over, I started work on October the 19th, 1982, at 624 North Beverly Drive, as a live-in nanny. <laughs> My first job, as she was leaving for a Jane Fonda workout class, was, can you empty the dishwasher? I'm in a kitchen that is bigger than my entire house. Every cabinet was identical. I had no idea what a dishwasher was. My mum was a dishwasher in our house. <laughs> but an hour later, I opened every cabinet, found it, emptied the dishes, mission accomplished. I was in that job for two years. And that was my welcome to America. And what I learned really quickly was, you know, yeah, I wasn't educated really, not like these people. But I was really street smart. I was every bit as street smart as them. And I learned a lot about rich people and what not to be like, what to be like. And I kind of liked it. I liked having money. I liked the idea, even though it wasn't my money, I was in their house. I liked it. <laughs> it, was kind of, it was kind of cool. In fact, they even let me bring my parents over after a year and a half and stay in the house. Because when I called my mum that first day to say, I'm okay, I'm, I'm here, she, I said, I've got a job. She went, job? What kind of job? Not guns, is it? I said, no, no. I'm, first of all, I'm living in Beverly Hills. She's like suspicious on the phone, I can tell. They gave me a car, and this is true. The only spare car they had was a Mercedes. So I said, I've got a Mercedes. She said, Mark. I said, it's, no, it's, it's a mansion. She said, but what are you doing for them? I'm a nanny. She said, if you, if you can't make up a better lie than that, don't bother. <laughs> anyway, from that I went on, you know, and I, I did learn that Americans, and I'm sure the same with Canadians, because, you know, Canadians are like Americans. They're like Americans with manners. <laughs> Sorry. That's kind of true though, right? Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot. I, I, I went on, the Americans give chances, and I went on and eventually I, I started selling t-shirts on Venice Beach. I, I rented 15 foot of fence 
for $100 per linear foot per month, 1,500 bucks. I'd saved up from the nanny job because I was getting paid $125 a week, saved up, bought t-shirts, and quickly made a ton of money selling t-shirts. I remember one day, and eventually, obviously, I left the nanny job and got myself an apartment. I remember one day from selling t-shirts, I had so much cash, I made a carpet out of the cash. And it was just so great to walk around barefoot on that money. <laughs> it was like, America is great, right? Um, but I learned so much from the nanny job. I learned so much from selling t-shirts on Venice Beach and dealing with people and realized, even though I'd never sold anything before and I was not, um, not confident really, I'd sold myself into a nanny job. I was able to sell t-shirts even though the first few weeks I was scared to death when anyone came over just to talk to me that, you know, would they really want to pay for this? And I was sort of apologetic that they were going to give me money for this T-shirt. But I got it, you know, and I figured out that you need to read people and only stupid people have the same sales pitch for every person. Because a person walking over who's an engineering type person has a different um, way to be spoken to about buying anything than an artist. Like if you're selling a car, for example, to an engineer, they want to hear about torque, you know, and the speed and the engine. An artist doesn't want to hear that. They want to hear, what's, it, what's the car smell like? What color is it? You know, you can't speak to everyone in the same way. You have to adapt, and I learned that so much on Venice Beach. You know, and I went on eventually, and I, you know, got into adventure, and I met some people here tonight from Malaysia, you know, I ended up going to Malaysia for a year and making a show called Eco Challenge, which was one of my first shows, which was an adventure show, which then led on to Survivor. And, you know, I made Eco Challenge, got my first Emmys for that. Um, and then Survivor, obviously, is still on the air. And I remember I'd made 12 Eco Challenges in remote jungles and mountains, which is one of my big loves, apart from my faith and my family. Being in jungles, mountains, and deserts is the thing that I want to do all the time. That's why I love BC. I love it here. Um, and then I've made like six survivors. So I've now made 18 shows in remote places. One year, I was gone seven months that year. And I had an agonizing phone call with my son, James. I can't he was very young at the time. I said, Daddy, I forgot what you look like. I was like, oh, man, this is not good, right? I've got to get a normal job in a city, you know? And I'm thinking, what can I do? What can I do? How can I make a show like Survivor in, in the city? And I thought, what do people need? They need jobs. Why don't I do like a 12-week job interview? There's got to have a hook to it, right? They've got to be working for like someone big and special and important. And I remembered two years earlier, I'd done the Survivor finale in New York City, in Central Park. And I'd rented Donald Trump's Wallman skating rink. Um, the story of that, by the way, is Trump had been promising his kids that this skating rink was getting finished by the New York City mayor, Koch. And New York City, because governments can't do anything right, right, screwed it up year after year. And Donald's so sick of apologizing to his kids why this skating rink that he's promised would get fixed on time and available to skate on for his children. So eventually, being Donald Trump, and my, my new friend here knows Donald very, very well from making this beautiful building in this city. And Donald, he's a very smart guy. He went to Canada and asked the Montreal Canadiens team, what is it that's going wrong in this New York City skating ring? And they came down and they said, this is a completely stupid way they're doing it. They're using Freon. They just need to use water and rubber hoses and it will work. So Trump knew that. Trump calls a press conference. Only Trump would do this. And totally embarrassed Mayor Koch and New York City that what idiots they were to waste so many millions and so many years to build a skating ring. And he would finish the whole thing for like a million dollars in 12 weeks. And Mayor Koch saw his opportunity to embarrass Donald Trump. And Don said, he said, okay. And Trump said, but the deal is, if I do this, I get the skating rink for life. It becomes the Trump skating rink. And Mayor Koch was so sure Donald wouldn't do it. He said, sure, 
not knowing that Trump had already taken the advice of exactly how to fix it. Sure enough, Canadians came down, fixed it, under 12 weeks, now Trump has the warmer skating rink. So now, cut to, I've rented this skating rink. I'm there and I've built bleachers for 5,000 people at Survivor Live, Central Park, and I get up there before all live shows to get the audience ready and explain what we need for live TV, it can't go wrong, and the energy they need. And I see Donald and Melania, before they were married, sitting in the front row, and so I, I realize, you know, I need to show respect to Mr. Trump. You know about that, right? Show respect to Mr. Trump. Um, and so I said this, I said, welcome everybody to the Trump Warman Skating Rink. The Trump Warman Skating Rink is a fine facility built by Mr. Donald Trump. Thank you, Mr. Trump, because the Trump Warman Skating Rink <laughs> is the place we are tonight. And we love being at the Trump Warman <laughs> Skating Rink. Mr. Trump, 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 Trump. <laughs> I get off stage, he says, yeah, you're a genius with this Survivor show. I'd love to work with you someday. Cut to, I'm sitting in the Amazon jungle, just had a conversation with my son James about seven months away and he can't remember what I look like. I'm thinking, who would be the, the billionaire for this TV show? Bingo, Donald Trump. So I come up with The Apprentice. The winner gets to work for Trump. I go back and I'm trying to figure out the details of how The Apprentice would be. And I'm gonna take two weeks. I'm going to New York for two weeks and I call Trump and I'm not ready for this. I've got two weeks to get myself ready to go on, because you know, it's one bullet, one kill with Trump. If you go and pitch him, and it's a no, it's a no. It's a yes, it's a yes. So I want to get myself ready. But I call, I think I need two weeks to get an appointment for him probably. So I'm in the car coming from JFK, and I call the number I've got for Trump's office, thinking I'm going to get some receptionist. He answered the phone himself. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I'm thinking of hanging up, right? <laughs> you know, it's one of those moments, I'm just not ready for this right now. And I said, oh, Mr. Trump, who's this? It's Mark Burnett. He said, oh, Survivor, genius. What's up? And I said, well, I've got this. You said about doing a show together a couple of years ago. He said, yeah, Survivor's gotten bigger than ever. It's the number one show. You want to do a show with me? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, I'm at the office now. Come over right now to Trump Tower and let's talk about it. And hung the phone up. I'm like, oh no, this cannot be happening. And so I'm thinking, do I call back and tell him I'm not ready? He's not going to respect that. So I go over there, and he's got all the security guards and all the elevator people in uniforms ready for me. Mr. Burnett, come on in. Go straight in. And I thought, I'm going to have to go for it. And I pitched The Apprentice, and I did a great job. <laughs> a great job. I was just, it's just meant to be, right? And Trump says, okay, everyone's asking me to do TV shows. This is smart. This could work. We'll do it. What's the deal? And I'd read enough Trump books to know how he works. I said, 50-50. He said, okay. We shook hands. He said, all you've got to do now, call my agent. Uh, he said, I know it sounds crazy, but I've got a Hollywood agent. Call him to do the paperwork. Deal's done. Just get the paperwork done. Brenda, that's his assistant, get Mark on with Jim. So I walk out. I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. I was going to be in two weeks' time. I've got a deal, I know I'm gonna sell this show, I'm gonna to get to live in America, see my kids, make money, this is great. I get on the phone with Jim, and Jim says, Mark, you've been in TV for you know, six, seven, eight years now, you know the rules. You can't speak to a client without going through the agent. I went, Jim, boo hoo, I did it, and we got a deal, it's great. He said, you don't have a deal. You have to do a deal with me. I said, Jim, I just made a deal with Donald Trump. He said, you have to pitch me the show now for me to approve it. And I'm like, oh. You know, who wants, all you people in business, you know what it's like. You go and make a deal. The last thing you want to do is like start again 10 minutes later. And so I pitched Jim, and I actually did a better job with Jim. And Jim says, I hate it. And I'm so bummed, right? And he said, nope, I'm telling Trump, no deal. Trump was swayed by you, this is stupid, this will never, it's gonna embarrass Donald, I've got bigger ideas for Donald. And, you know, so I hang up the phone, so I've gone from like elation to totally bummed, right? And now I've got, and I walk back in and, and Trump's like, come in! And I walk, he says, hey, survivor guy. He always calls me survivor guy, right? 
It's like I've survived some illness or something, right? <laughs> right. Uh, um, and he said, get it done. I said, got bad news. I called Jim about the paperwork. He made me repitch it. He said, you do it? I said, yeah. What did he say? He said, no deal. He hates it. He said to me, I shook your hand, right? I said, yeah. He said, okay. Norma! <laughs> she comes in. She says, take a letter to Jim. Dear Jim, I'm doing The Apprentice. You're fired. <laughs> and I realized there... Trump's a terrible enemy to have and a, gr and a great friend to have, which I'm sure you've realized. He's laughing because he knows it's true. I've got to finish with this lot one on Trump. I've probably run out of time already, right? But, um, and I haven't even spoke about the Bible. Um, today, I was on the phone with Trump, you know, um, and talking about being here tonight and, and your beautiful building. And uh, as only Trump could do this, I'm on the phone with him discussing being here, and he says, oh, I gotta go, Miss Universe just walked into my office. <laughs> and you know he's not lying. <laughs> Only Donald Trump could do that, right? Um, anyway, listen, it's been, you know, I've done a lot of weird things in my career, right, obviously, and when I said I'll do The Voice, you know, people said there's no way another singing show works. You know, and I'd, if you look at something, all my shows are good fun, and they're family shows between Roma's Touched by an Angel, Survivor, Apprentice, Shark Tank, The Voice. They're all family shows. But I didn't want to do a singing show because I really thought those American Idol shows were really mean to people. They were bringing up people who couldn't sing deliberately just for Simon to rip them, you know, and make them, humiliate them. And I know they got ratings, but I just don't want to be doing that stuff. And so The Voice, I felt, was kinder. You know, and there was, we, we replaced the humiliation element with a game show element where the coaches would be vying, you know how it works, vying for the singers, and the coaches would argue among themselves rather than humiliate singers. And, you know, and it's worked, obviously, in this number one show. So you know, I went on and did that. But you know what really happened? This equity that I built, I mean, human equity in a lot of successes, and also, are you smarter than the fifth grader? I mean, 600 episodes of that show in 58 countries, Apprentices in 40 countries, Survivors in 40 countries. I mean, like, we do, we're global business, and it's a, it's a good business. And that allowed me and Roma to decide when, that, to bring our faith to the forefront and be a lot noisier uh, as Christians, um, and go to convince someone to allow us to make the Bible. And you can imagine those conversations, right, where people think, you know, yeah, they're really successful in television. We're, we're, most people don't get one hit. We've had like six or seven hits. It's sort of unbelievable, and it's God's favor on us. And I didn't know why, but God's favor was on to allow us to make the Bible. If we hadn't have had all these shows, and if I wasn't so nutty at times, you know, God doesn't always choose the calm qualify people he qualifies the called and called us and we knew it on our hearts and so when we went at those meetings people were like are you kidding the bible on prime time tv even you mark and you roma there's no way we're doing that it was no 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 and then history channel said in the first 30 minutes they said you know this could really work and the only people who said that but then, of course, we got the deal done. It was in the newspapers, and everyone else was saying, you guys, two, two mistakes here. No one cares about the Bible. No one's watching the Bible on primetime TV. They can go to church on a Sunday for that or Sunday school. No one's watching the Bible. And secondly, you guys are insane. You're going to kill your marriage. You know, most people can't even do yard work together, right? Let alone go to Morocco over six months and shoot a Bible series with all that pressure. They were wrong, 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 wrong. Not only did our marriage get stronger, we're better friends and more in love than ever. I mean, I'm married to an angel. How bad is that? <laughs> right. But the Bible series came on and did 100 million viewers in America. It comes on in Canada, and I remember being up with these guys, and Lorna, up in Toronto, and Jeff, and, you know, 
the conventional wisdom in Canada was not going to work in Canada because it's a secular country. Canadians are not going to watch the Bible in prime time. Well, they were wrong. It beat hockey. And I thought that was the religion up here. And then the Bible went around and went to Australia with only seven days' notice, 10 million Australians. Uh, it, it actually, South America and went number one. It was only beaten one night in Chile. I'm oh, sorry, Colombia. One night was beaten, and it was beaten by the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Very appropriate. I don't mind being beaten by the Ten Commandments. As long as it's not the Kardashians beating me. As long as it, um, and then Australia, we only had seven days' notice. And then they said, not going to work in Australia. Australia is worse than Canada in terms of secular. There's no way it's going to work in Australia. And then, for whatever reason, didn't understand why would God rush us when we had three months to market it in Australia, and now they've rushed forward with seven days. And we called several big churches, and Jeff Tunnicliffe helped us with Hillsong. Ten million Australians watched the Bible. It's incredible. No one could even, and still the newspaper was saying, what's happening to Australia? Everyone's watching the Bible. And what's great is, and this week, Hong Kong. It goes number one in Hong Kong this week. And what it is, is the conventional wisdom don't understand this tribe. It's the most powerful tribe in the world. Is the Christian tribe. That's right. Amen. The only thing we don't do, we don't stand together enough. And we're not noisy enough. I'm a really, really noisy Christian. I go on major TV shows with my wife, which are secular shows, and say, absolutely, we believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We are Christians. We're proud of it. And it's great. And because we have all these successful shows, they can't say anything. They're like, <laughs> okay. And what the Bible did, the Bible gave permission for millions of people in America, Canada, Australia to talk about God. Because it's a lot easier to say, hey, do you see that Bible series? Than to walk up and say, hey, let's talk about the Bible. It's a conversation starter. God is smart. God is really good with his planning. God makes things happen. And who knew that the Bible series would be the conversation starter that got people advocating again and standing together. We, we joined the Catholic Church with the evangelicals on this project. Everybody worked together for three years to get the text right, to make sure it was right. And by the way, you know you're not at a Catholic event tonight because there's no wine. <laughs> you can always tell it's a Catholic event or not, right? We're at an evangelical event tonight. It's water. Going to change that next year. All right. I'm dying for a glass of wine. You do understand, Rick, that wine was mentioned in Genesis. It's been around long enough for you to allow it at this event, don't you think? <laughs> anyway, listen. Not my event, a bit cheeky to be at someone's dinner party and complain about the lack of wine, but whatever. <laughs> um, so we've now gone on and taken the Bible series and we shot lots of extra footage and we've edited it now into a feature film called Son of God, which is just about Jesus. And again, people said, you'll never get it distributed in America, no one's putting that in the major theaters when they can watch Thor or Batman or Superman. They were wrong. 20th Century Fox stepped up and have allowed us to distribute Son of God through 20th Century Fox, which is epic. It's going to be in thousands of screens. And it's going to be on February 28th next year. And um, how about I show you, how about I show you a little footage, two minutes. Right. So, so I'm going to show you, it's the footage from, from the Son of God um, with uh, some music. And the music is called Hope is What We Crave. Let's, let's look, have a look at the footage.
people today, they called you king. They think you were a messiah. Who do you think I am? You are the son of God. Hope sleeps without me. Her sweet dreams surround me. But I'm left out. I need a fix now. To believe. To feel. Hope is what we crave, and that will never change. So I stand in front. People crave a lot of things, right? Iniquity, sin, more money than they need, negative things. How about craving hope? Isn't that cool? It's beautiful, right? And that's what that's what the movie's about. And you know, this is a business community in Vancouver, you know, and we'll provide ways to reach you all. Those of you who feel called, maybe you can become theatre captains. Maybe you can take friends. Some of you will take entire theatres and pray after it. This is two hours, 15 minutes. There is no way anybody leaves this movie without being full of the Holy Spirit. There is no way. We've seen all the screenings now, and there'll be a screening tomorrow afternoon in Richmond. I'm not sure how many seats there are left. Every screening in Colorado, New York City, Los Angeles, every screening we've done... People are stunned and cannot get out of their seats because it is the story of our Lord in a really compelling, beautiful way. And it moves people. And now we're not, we're not stopping because the Bible series, it was number one. We're going on with this now. And now we've focused from the Bible onto Jesus. And you'll see from the beginning of this movie, we make a very clear statement. Roma and I completely know that Jesus is God. And the whole movie starts with John on Patmos. And the first word you hear in the movie is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the whole movie starts from there, from Patmos. And you see Jesus in the Old Testament. And it goes right through his life, from the trial, the crucifixion, right through the resurrection and the ascension and the Great Commission and ends up back at Patmos in 2 hours 15 minutes. This is the biggest evangel evangelizing tool you can imagine. This week, in fact, Roma uh, screened for all of the Catholic bishops and cardinals in Baltimore last Monday and they have got behind it and said they're going to make it an official teaching tool for the Catholic Church. It's exactly what we wanted. Exactly what we wanted. And I want to take it around the world. And the goal is that in the next couple of decades, three decades, let's hope you know, more than half the planet have seen this. This is the way to start the conversations. This isn't the Bible isn't the only story of Jesus. It's only two hours, 15 minutes. But you know what it is? It's like if you think of Mark 4, and what Mark 4 is about, at the end of Mark 4, um, is when the disciples are asking Jesus, you know, why do you always speak in parables? And he explains he only will ever speak in large groups in parables. He, and he only ever 
basically untied the fishing knots of knowledge with the disciples in smaller groups. So think of what this is doing. This is the large parable, and we need to funnel people into church groups to have the details explained. And that's the job of the churches and the job of all of you. And so we all take the large funnel and funnel it in. And those of you who are called can use this in February and become theatre captains. Some of you can afford to book entire theatres. Like an entire theatre is $2,500 for, what's that, for 250 seats? What is it now? $10 a ticket, I guess. Some of you, and some people in New York stepped up, have bought markets, bought four theatres out for every showing at every weekend, and are going to bring churches. There's lots of ways to do it. But what we do want to make sure is the same news comes out as when the Bible came on in Canada, which is we don't want the news to be that movies like The 300 or movies like Superman are the movies that I get talked about on everyone's lips. We want Jesus to be on everybody's lips. And that's why we've taken our equity of our success and got this made. And now it's up to the community to stand up because actually you are part of the largest army on earth. 2.2 billion of us. But you know what we don't do? We do not stand together. We're supposed to become the world is one, W-O-N, when the church is one, O-N-E. Unity is what's needed. And I'll leave you with something very important. I don't know what I'm going to say is accurate, but it's what I've been on my heart lately. It's about Asia. Think of when Jesus died and resurrected and gave the Great Commission and sent the disciples out. All the ones that went east failed didn't work right but the ones who went east it worked and what is the bible and jesus about light what way does light move on the planet only west so and everywhere that christianity settled became the world power think about this through greece rome france england spain then years later it goes across to america the light is moving west. Christianity settles on Canada and America, the world power. But not anymore. The light has moved east. Where's the fastest growing Christianity in the world? It's in Asia. Because the light has moved west. And that's what's happening. And I believe it will settle there for decades and the light will continue moving on. And the challenge will be getting through the Middle East and spreading the light when the, when the critical mass of Asian Christians of China and Malaysia and Korea, when the critical mass happens and it spreads and they evangelize going east, going west, and it carries on with the light going west, the light will settle back on Jerusalem. I don't know that what I've said is accurate, but it's what I think. Anyway, God bless you, and please support Son of God. Love you all. I'm so glad to be here. And please be much noisier about your faith. Don't be meek does not mean weak. We were told to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents. We've all done a pretty good job being harmless. Don't forget the wise part. Thank you. Thank you.